Dr. Eugenie C. Scott, uh, who will uh, give us uh, additional insight into the type of education ASTAR judges uh, will receive. Uh, Dr. Scott is the Executive Director for the National Center for Science Education Incorporated. Dr. Scott uh, was a faculty presenter at the October 2006 National Judges Science School, where uh, she uh, presented on the topic of evolutionary biology. Dr. Scott is the author of Evolution versus Creationism, an Introduction, and has authored many articles in science journals. Uh, she has received numerous honors, including uh, being named in 2009 in the uh, Scientific American as uh, one of the 10 outstanding leaders involved in research, business, or policy pursuits that have advanced science and technology. It is my pleasure to uh, call forward our presenter, Dr. Scott. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you for inviting me. I must say, I'm not a, a formal ASTAR presenter. I've been very pleased to work with them in the past, but um, they cannot be blamed for any errors that I make today. Um, I and my staff have been consulted on a number of cases over the years involving the teaching of evolution, the most recent being uh, Kitzmiller versus Dover. This was a uh, trial in Dover, Pennsylvania before Federal District Court involving a decision by the Board of Education in Dover to uh, require the teaching of intelligent design. A group of parents sued to keep intelligent design out of their students' classroom, and um, Federal District Court Judge John E. Jones ruled against the district that intelligent design was not science, it was a religious view to advocate it in the public schools would be advocating religion and therefore in violation of the First Amendment. I was, um, full disclosure here, NCSE advised the plaintiff's legal team, we recommended expert witnesses and advised on scientific and educational issues. When we first began working with the plaintiff's lawyers, um, this picture is on the last day of court, so if they're looking a little bit nervous, you can kind of see why, perhaps. Um, so this was, we began working with them, obviously, over a year earlier. Um, I remember mentioning to Eric Rothschild that, um, you know, boy, uh, the science in this issue is, is, is really easy, but, you know, boy, the, the law is really something hard to keep track of. And he looked at me like I was totally nuts. He said, are you kidding? The law, is, the law is completely clear on this issue. The law is no problem at all. It's the science we don't understand. So I thought, well, boy, this is going to be a real educational experience for both of us. And of course, it, it, it certainly was. Uh, we spent a lot of time teaching the lawyers enough science so that they could properly cross-examine the witnesses for the other side. And um, they did a, a very good job, as uh, Judge Jones has commented in articles that he has written. Well, I was asked here today to talk a little bit about the science. Uh, I am a scientist. I work for an advocacy organization, but I spend an awful lot of time behind a much smaller podium than this at universities and uh, before science teachers. So I'm, usually, I, I'm very delighted to be able to talk about just plain science for a change. It's not very often I get that opportunity. So let's talk a little bit about the science of evolution. <clears throat> uh, first of all, it is indeed the case that Americans are um, outstanding in many ways, and one way that we stand out is in our very high percentage of rejection of the idea of evolution. The Canadian Angus Reid polling organization this year found that 51% of Americans reject that humans evolve, and only 35% accept this. Similarly, only 41% know that humans and dinosaurs did not coexist, which means 60% of them either think they did or don't know. That is not a very good sign of 
general science literacy. If you compare the views of Americans uh, to those of other countries, and I will not try to make you read this because you will all go blind, here is the um, uh, question that we asked in this survey. Humans evolved from earlier forms of animals, true or false? The blue represents ex uh, true, the yellow don't know, the red is false. And if you want to know where the United States is, we beat Turkey. <clears throat> um, this 2009 poll by the Pew Organization shows a much higher percentage of acceptance of evolution in, uh, among scientists than in the general public. Um, it's, um, uh, it's really quite striking, the, the percentage differences. And not to belabor the issue, a survey of physicians also shows a high percentage of acceptance of evolution. This survey was in 2005. 18% of them uh, believed that God created humans pretty much as they are today. But a total of 80% of them agreed either that uh, God uh, guided the process of evolution or evolution occurred without the guidance of God. Uh, here in Ohio in 2002, when there was a large controversy, a long controversy over the science education standards, a uh, poll was taken of Ohio scientists in both sectarian as well as secular uh, schools, and um, a very large percentage of Ohio scientists agreed that evolution is a very strong scientific idea. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about biological evolution, but I, I do want to make sure that you all realize that evolution is a very broad concept that crosses all scientific disciplines, because in the broadest sense, what evolution means is that the universe has had a history, that there has been a cumulative change over time in the um, universe in which we live, that the past is different from the present. Astronomy is an evolutionary science because galaxies have cumulatively changed through time. They have formed out of gases, the stars have, have changed positions, and so forth. It is also true that geology and uh, planetary sciences are also evolutionary sciences because the planet Earth has cumulatively changed through time over the um, last four and a point uh, two billion years. Biology is an evolutionary science, as we know. Plants and animals have cumulatively changed through time. And anthropology is an evolutionary science as well, because human cultures have cumulatively changed through time. Now, I'm going to talk mostly about biological evolution, which has the added inference that living things have common ancestors. But do be aware that anti-evolution sentiments do affect all aspects of science. Astronomers get hammered for age of the Earth and Big Bang. Uh, geologists uh, get uh, pressure from school boards and from parents and teachers and so forth about the teaching of um, the age of the Earth particularly. And obviously biologists get um, uh, criticized for the teaching of biological evolution. Do note, however, that evolution is a controversial topic at the kindergarten through 12th level. It is not a controversial topic at the university level. I have just come uh, yesterday, I was giving a presentation at um, uh, Indiana Fort Wayne, and uh, one of the slides I showed, which I might have shown here, was a uh, big inlay in the floor of a science building of a large Midwestern university. And the inlay was a quotation from a famous scientist uh, who published an article back in the 70s. The title of the article was, Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. And the author was the geneticist Theodosius Dobzhansky. And that, that's, it's really big. It's, you know, it's, it's big as I can reach, and this big circular um, uh, uh, inlay in, in the marble floor there. And I asked the students if, if they knew where what that large Midwestern university was, and nobody did. It's Notre Dame. Okay. And similarly, I've spoken at, um, at Brigham Young University, uh, at which evolution is taught matter-of-factly in astronomy, geology, and anthropology, and biology. At Baylor University, 
evolution is taught matter-of-factly. It is not a controversial issue at the university level. It is very controversial at the K-12 level. The reason for that has to do with the politicization of education in this country and the fact that so many decisions are made by elected school boards, which is something we can talk about at some other time. Um, evolution is a three-part idea. I mentioned that evolution uh, involve the idea of common ancestry. That's the big idea of evolution. The way we study evolution tends to be to look at the mechanisms or processes of evolution, the most important of which is natural selection, but there are other processes as well which are important. We also look at evolution in terms of the patterns of evolution. How did the tree of life branch and split through time? I'm going to talk about each of these three, and I'm going to first talk about the big idea of evolution, because the idea of common ancestry is not very well understood by most Americans. Uh, if you ask most, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, many Americans understand evolution as sort of a great chain of being, uh, an old Aristotelian idea in which uh, the great chain of being or ladder of life allowed you to rank all of nature from the insensible to the uh, lower up through the angels up to God in heaven. And uh, you ranked nature in terms of uh, complexity or purity or closeness to God. Uh, humans, of course, were at the top. Now, in the Middle Ages, this idea was incorporated into Christianity as part of a theological view called special creation in the belief that God specially created all creatures as separate kinds, reflecting their position on this great chain of being. It really was an Aristotelian idea that somehow got incorporated into Christianity. And most Americans still understand evolution in this same fashion. They believe that simple invertebrates evolved into more complex invertebrates and then evolved into simple vertebrates, which evolved into more complex in, uh, vertebrates and, you know, Amphibians evolved into reptiles, reptiles evolved into mammals, and then, of course, human beings are up at the top and the most superior uh, creatures of all. But this is really not what evolution is all about. What evolution is about is the splitting and branching of lineages through time. It's about the idea that living things have common ancestors. So let's take that same array of animals and look at it from the standpoint of an evolutionary biologist. We and the modern African ape shared a common ancestor fairly recently in time. And we shared a common mammalian ancestor, we and the apes shared a common mammalian ancestor, um, farther back in time with the other mammals. Now this original mammal ancestor did not look like modern mammals. It didn't look like uh, um, much of anything. It was a very generalized, warm-blooded, furry little creature that had a lot of potential to radiate into a variety of different kinds of, of niches and form the huge variety of mammals that we have today. Further back in time, uh, an amniote ancestor gave rise to the mammal group as well as the reptile group. Now, amniotes are uh, the large group of animals, which includes reptiles, mammals, and birds, which have an amniotic egg, a kind of egg that can be, land, that can be laid on land um, as opposed to an amphibian egg, which has to remain moist all the time, or a fish egg. Further back in time, an ancestral tetrapod, tetra meaning four leg, gave rise to the amniotes as well as modern day amphibians. You're seeing a pattern here. We're talking about common ancestry being the key to understanding what evolution is all about. This tetrapod did not look very much like living amphibians. It would really be incorrect to call it an amphibian since it didn't look very much like frogs and salamanders and the other creatures that we understand when we think about amphibians. It was a very generalized kind of creature which actually looked fairly fishy. You have to go considerably further back in time to find an aquatic vertebrate which was ancestral to the tetrapods as well as to the modern fish. This creature did not look very much like the fish swimming around in your goldfish bowl or one that you might have eaten for dinner recently. It didn't look very much like a modern fish at all. It looked like a very primitive kind of lumpy sort of thing that had uh, fins and, and um, uh, a mouth and a, a tail and so forth, but didn't look like the very fancy fish we have today that, that have uh, a number of very derived and, and highly adapted features. No modern animal is ancestral to any other modern animal. 
but all modern animals share common ancestors further and further back through time. You have to go back very far into the Precambrian or the Cambrian, which is 560 million years ago, before you find the common ancestor of the vertebrates and the invertebrates. And this creature was what paleontologists refer to as a bilaterian. It was bilaterally symmetrical. It basically was a tube. We have burrow traces so we can get an idea of what these creatures looked like, although obviously no great details. They were soft-bodied, they had a mouth at one end, an anus at another end, and a gut in between, and they had segments. Given that, you can do a lot uh, with the right kinds of genetics. Uh, you can get insects and arthropods and, and uh, mollusks and all the invertebrates, and eventually you get vertebrates as well. So common ancestry is really what evolution is all about. I want to talk about the processes or mechanisms of, of evolution next. Now, Darwin, of course, came up with the idea of natural selection, but it's one of the uh, causes that I have in life when I lecture on college campuses is to try to discourage people from referring to evolutionary biology as Darwinism. Because geologists don't refer to geology as Lyellism, and physicists don't refer to physics as Kelvinism, so there's no reason for us to refer to evolutionary biology as Darwinism, as if we have not learned anything since uh, Darwin's day. We have learned a great deal since Darwin's day. Here's how we understand the process of natural selection and general evolution today. Number one, we start with a population. Uh, because individuals don't evolve, only populations evolve or don't evolve. And at one period of time, if we were to look at this population, say it's rabbits or pine trees or whatever, we would find that there is a great deal of variation. Not all pine trees are the same height, not all rabbits have the same amount of fur, and there would be biochemical differences between the, among the rabbits and so forth. So there's a variety of different, uh, there, there are creatures that contain a lot of variations within any natural population. We've got a pretty good idea of the source of these variations. They come from largely genetic processes like recombination, mutation, non-random mating, and so forth and so on. And these genetic processes mix up the variation every generation. Every generation there's new variation coming into a population from these genetic sources. Now populations, of course, occur in habitats and environments in which populations occur uh, have challenges. Um, there may be challenges uh, from the weather or from being able to find nesting sites or being able to find mates or uh, food or keeping from being somebody else's food. There's a lot of challenges that occur in any environment. And it is the case that some of those individuals may be better at withstanding those challenges than others. If it's an environment that turns suddenly cold, those rabbits that have the thicker coats are more likely to survive and leave offspring than those that don't. And this is what the factor, this is what natural selection is, is about. There are other factors that also act upon the variation in the population to change the population so that it is better adjusted to its environment, or in some cases in very small populations, the changes are not necessarily adaptive, but just the result of of chance or random factors. Um, this is what genetic drift is all about and also founder effect. What happens when every generation you have variation brought into the population, every generation you have a sifting and winnowing of that variation to adapt it to whatever changes that are taking place in environments, and there are always changes taking place in environments, what happens is you get change. And what happens if you continue this change generation after generation? It's called evolution. You notice that genes are kind of the currency of what I'm talking about here, and I'll come back to genes in a moment. Let's talk now briefly about the patterns of evolution. Now, life is composed of not five kingdoms, which is what I learned back in the Pleistocene when I went to school, and what probably many of you learned, except for you youngsters out there. Are there any young judges? Never mind, we won't go there, we won't go there. The three, the three main domains of life are the bacteria and the archaea, which are single-celled organisms, and the eukaryotes, which are most of which are single-celled organisms, but also including organisms that, have, that are multicellular, like us. Um, eukaryotes are creatures which, in their cells, there are nuclei 
uh, which contain the genetic material. There's other characteristics as well. And for a variety of reasons, eukaryotes seem to be much better able to form multicellular organism, organisms than bacteria and archaea, because these other guys haven't done so. When I'm talking about the patterns of evolution and the other characteristics of evolution, please understand this is more than just evolution light. This is evolution exceedingly light. I'm not even going to give you a lot of details about evolution. I'm going to try to give you the reasoning that evolutionary biologists use because I think that would be more useful to you in trying to understand what evolution is all about. I'm also going to be stressing the fact that evolution is an inference because a court of law is one in which you are very familiar with using inferential reasoning to come to decisions. And what you do in a court of law, looking at various sources of evidence to try to come to a conclusion about something that was not witnessed. Nobody was there to see that bank robbed. But we do have the bank robber and he's got the orange paste all over his fingers and there's some other reasons to make you think that maybe this is the guy that did it. But nobody witnessed it, but you can still make very good inferences as to who robbed the bank. Similarly, Common ancestry is an inference that we make about a number of different sources of data that all seem to lead in the same direction, that it is most logical and most reasonable to assume that the pattern that we see in all these various sources of data is the result of common ancestry. So this is, this, that's sort of the general outline of what I'm going to be talking about for the next uh, five or ten minutes or so. Now, I want to go back to this basic concept of common ancestry for a moment, and the idea of descent with modification, which was the, the wonderfully 19th century uh, phrase that Charles Darwin used. I'm, I'm going to use an analogy of a pedigree, of a, of a, of a um, um, family tree, if you will, because I and you have also descended with modification, and it's a good illustration of how genes are passed down in one kind of context. So. My sister Sue and I are the children of my father. Uh, father is the son of Grandpa. Grandpa is the father of Uncle John. Uncle John is the parent of Cousin Liz. Okay? Everybody's seen a family tree like this. It's very easy to devise. Now, I want you to consider something. Sue and I look more like each other than we look like Cousin Liz because Sue and I cha shared a common ancestor in Dad more recently than we shared a common ancestor with Liz in Grandpa. Grandpa passed down genes to his two children. He passed down genes to Dad. Dad passed down genes to me. He passed down genes to Uncle John. Uncle John passed down genes to Cousin Liz. The nature of genetics is that these genes get mixed and sorted around as they pass through different generations, and they may change. But basically, Cousin Liz, Sue, and I all share genes that are inherited from Grandpa because we inherited them through our father, who is the son of our grandfather. So genes are kind of the currency of what we're talking about here. Also notice that this, this very simple little family tree of mine um, provides for the, a hierarchical grouping of individuals, and you could think of this as a hierarchical grouping of genes as well. The same principle works with larger groups, with populations. Remember we talked about Populations evolve, not individuals. So bears and dogs look more like each other than they look like lions because bears and dogs shared a common caniform or dog-like ancestor with each other more recently than they shared a common carnivore ancestor with lions. And Cebus and howler monkeys look more like each other than they look like apes because the monkeys shared a common monkey-like ancestor with each other more recently than they shared a common primate ancestor with apes. But... Bears and apes look more like each other than they look like salamanders because bears and apes shared a common mammal ancestor with each other than they shared a common vertebrate ancestor with salamanders. Branching and splitting of lineages, passing down of genes, and the generation of a hierarchical grouping of, in this case, populations, in this case, species, or, or probably families, of, of organisms. This, can, this, is what, this is how we... This is how we look at evolution. This is how we, we create a picture, a pattern of evolution through time. Here's a tree of the relationship of living primates. Other trees of other organisms, organisms would look similarly. Branching and splitting again looks a little bit like that um, last diagram that I showed you. Hierarchical groupings. 
Okay, so how do we decide which organisms are to be grouped together? How do we determine um, which ones we put together? And uh, uh, how do we determine their similarities and differences? Ascertaining the relationships of organisms largely is done through the study of something called homology. Now, this is going to sound tautological, but hang in there with me, because it isn't. The definition of, ta of homology is similarity as a result of common ancestry. But don't confuse the definition of homology with the practice of creating trees. Uh, otherwise, you'll get in a circle here. We don't assume evolution when we, con when we construct a tree. Um, but evolution emerges because the similarities and differences of the characteristics that we use result in hierarchical groupings because evolution generates hierarchy. Just as we saw with my family tree, the passing down of genes generates this sort of hierarchy because you get this generational split. So similarly, with lineages of organisms, you get this branching and splitting and this hierarchical grouping. This is um, uh, an example of a tree done of um, dogs and cats. Um, it may not look like dogs and cats, but hang in there. Uh, this is based upon comparative anatomy. When you look at the bones, the teeth, um, the muscles, the skin, when you look at a variety of characteristics, size and shape of the uh, visible anatomy, you find that um, they cluster into two general groups. One that we call cats that includes things like house cats and lynxes and lions and tigers. I'm sorry, yes, lions and tigers. And they group with uh, uh, civets and with hyenas as far as the closest groupings. Similarly, if we look at dogs, dogs uh, group most closely with bears. Uh, dogs and bears are actually very similar anatomically. Now, again, when you compare the similarities and differences of anatomy among all these various animals, you get um, a hierarchical grouping uh, based on anatomy. A little further away from dogs and bears are the um, um, weasel group, which is related to the dogs, but not as closely as, say, bears are. Another way that you can build a tree is through looking at homologies seen at the biochemical or molecular level. And one method involves DNA hybridization, where you take the DNA of two species and you heat it up, which breaks apart the strands of the DNA, and then you let it cool down and you mix the strands together, and then you measure how much the two species strands uh, anneal or come together. And the more closely those two strands of DNA from the two different organisms uh, link together, the more closely the genes, the more closely they had a common ancestor. Again, genes are the currency for running through this whole thing. If we look at DNA patterns of dogs and cats, uh, here are the cats over here on this side of the diagram, we find that cats, again, clump with hyenas and with civets. We find dogs, again, clump with bears. Uh, we find the same sort of patterns when we look at comparative anatomy as when we look at DNA. And when we look at other molecules, we get these same sorts of, of hierarchical groupings and the same sort of patterns show. This is also true of embryology. So this is, you know, this is pretty good, um, uh, pretty good um, encouragement for us to make this inference that uh, um, cats are more closely related to hyenas than they are to bears. Uh, because we have so many different strands of evidence from molecules, from DNA, from comparative anatomy, from embryology that all point in the same direction. It supports our inference that we make about the structure of these trees. Um, Comparative anatomy of living forms also helps us to interpret the fossil record and vice versa. It happens that the middle ear bones of dinosaurs are very similar to those of birds. It's one of many anatomical traits linking birds and dinosaurs. A large number of traits encourage the conclusion of paleontologists that birds actually did arise from a lineage of dinosaurs. So when you're having your Thanksgiving dinner, just you know, tell the kids this is really just a little tiny T-Rex, but it's tasty. And actually, we have lots of bird fossils. Within the last 20 years, there's been a wonderful explosion of fossil information, particularly from uh, new beds discovered in China that, that have wonderful preservation. We have lots of bird, we have dinosaur to bird fossils showing lots and lots of transitional stages, which is really quite wonderful. <laughs> Fossils tend to be bones and teeth, so comparative anatomical comparisons tend to be used more than biochemical ones. There are some few cases where DNA or some other protein can be extracted, but it's pretty rare. 
Uh, this slide shows the anatomy of limb bones, of fossils leading from aquatic vertebrates on the left to land vertebrates on the right. Um, you can see how through time the bones uh, change from many, many bones to uh, fewer bones. Um, if you take a look at that final far right uh, construction there, that, my friends, is pretty much what you've got in your, in your arm or leg. You have one large bone close to the body, two smaller bones a little bit further away, a bunch of little bones, which we call a wrist, and then a fan of bones, which we call fingers or toes. That's the same basic pattern that you have for all land vertebrates which is another kind of cool thing that I like to talk about, but I won't have time to. Uh, similarly, if we compare the anatomy of the pelvis of fossil whales, this helps us understand the changes that have taken time through, place through time from the land-living ancestors of whales at the top of the uh, diagram, which have a pelvis looking very similar to that of um, uh, quadrupedal uh, uh, mammals, down to the sort of blobby looking thing at the bottom, which is what the pelvis of a whale looks like. Whales, of course, don't support their um, back part of their body on legs, so the, the uh, pelvis of a whale is pretty uh, vestigial. Another very good series of fossils, by the way, in addition to the bird dino transition, is the transition of a land mammal, interestingly enough, related to the hoofed animals, to modern day whales. There's been a a, quite an explosion of fossils of uh, whales as well, which is a fascinating thing for us in, in uh, evolutionary biology. This is only a, this is not all of the fossils. There are many more than, than I'm showing you here. Sometimes I hear when I travel around and get calls from AM radio, which nobody should have to face, but I, I hear, you know, oh, well, of course, all human fossils can just be put into one box. Well, that's a lot of nonsense. The human fossil record is very good, which doesn't mean we have to stop looking because we always need more to sort out the problems that we have. This is not all of the fossil skulls there are. Uh, this is just a selection of some very good ones. And um, it's, uh, it, you know, it's clear that, that we're not dealing with uh, one small box of information in any stretch of the imagination. Well, let's talk a little bit about why we have this problem with evolution today. In his book On the Origin of Species, Darwin made two major points. He said that living things had evolved, they had descended with modification from common ancestors, and he contended that natural selection was the major engine that was driving this process. Not the only factor, but the most important one. The idea of natural selection was particularly uh, disturbing to his colleagues. Interestingly enough, um, the scientific community and, and the clergy accepted the idea of common ancestry fairly quickly. It only took maybe a decade or, or so for the British clergy to come around to the idea of common ancestry. This wasn't a problem. Natural selection was a harder sell. Part of that was because Darwin didn't know anything about genetics, and once you know something about genetics, then uh, natural selection becomes a much more plausible explanation, and he was, he was uh, traveling in the dark there. But the main reason why natural selection was such a problem had to do with the view that everybody pretty much agreed with before Darwin, which was that of the British cleric William Paley. William Paley proposed the argument from design. Now, this is going to sound very familiar. You have all heard this story. You are walking along a heath, and you come across a rock. This rock might have been there forever, for all you know. This is not an unusual thing to see a rock upon a heath. But if you saw a pocket watch, sounding familiar now? Yeah, the pocket watch on the heath. Paley's classic example. If you saw a pocket watch on the heath, you would know that that watch had to be the product of a, an intelligent human being. There had to have been a watchmaker because watches just don't naturally appear on heaths. Uh, the reason for that is the watch is an artifact um, that human beings make. It, is, it has springs and wires and, and all these pieces that are put together to let you uh, measure time. And so you know that that's not something that just could come together naturally. Uh, springs and wires don't just automatically come together and, and make watches. So Paley reasoned, if you see a complicated structure like the vertebrate eye, or as modern intelligent design proponents today would say, the bacteria flagellum, which is their replacement for the vertebrate eye, 
Paley said, if you see a complex structure like the vertebrate eye, you know it couldn't have been the product of just a natural process. It's too complicated for nature to produce, therefore there had to have been a god. So his book, Natural Theology, was an apologetic. It was a, it was an, a, a religious argument for the existence of God, and everybody thought it was a really great idea. Then Darwin came along and came up with this idea of natural selection, which is a natural way of building complexity. And Darwin was very clever. He knew that everybody reading his book would have read Paley and would know the story about the watch on the heath and the eye and all this stuff. And so he used the vertebrate eye as the example of something that could be built by natural selection. He was very clever that way. The two parts idea, the two parts of Darwin's idea of evolution through natural selection was a double whammy. The idea that evolution happened uh, challenged the idea of special creation, the literal view of the Bible. And this was difficult for many clerics. In Great Britain, this was not a big problem because the Anglican clergy was not especially literalist in their theology. Just as a footnote here, if you know the history of American religion, uh, the religion known as fundamentalism is a fairly recent development. Biblical literalism is a fairly recent development in American uh, Christianity. It came about in about the second um, decade of the 20th century, the 19-teens, uh, and it was um, uh, developed by a group of actually Southern California businessmen who um, wrote a series of pamphlets called The Twelve Fundamentals, which was where the term fundamentalism comes from, and circulated these widely to um, uh, Christian uh, seminaries and also to ministers around the country. It hit at the time of first the World War where there was a lot of you know, turmoil anyway, and these ideas uh, were seized upon with, with great interest by many um, Americans who then went on to develop um, a form of evangelical Christianity called fundamentalism. But biblical literalism is not something that you find in Catholicism or most Lutheranism uh, and uh, Presbyterianism, Episcopalian, mainstream Protestantism. But for those who do interpret the Bible literally, this is a real problem because the idea of common ancestry is not compatible with biblical literalism. The idea of natural selection, though, as I mentioned, was a bigger problem. It certainly challenged the idea of design, the idea that God's direct hand created things specially, like vertebrate eyes and adapted the deer uh, to uh, give it long legs so it could run away, also adapted the wolf with strong teeth so it could catch the deer. Um, but taking God out of the equation made God less personal for many Christians, and so this was a problem for many when they considered evolution by natural selection. Then there was also the problem of theodicy, which is a term from Christian theology referring to the existence of evil. Bad things happen. Disasters occur. There's a great deal of want and hunger and suffering in the planet, even including animals, which are innocent. And you know, how do you explain why all these bad things happen? Well, a literal translation of the Bible solves this problem because biblical literalists can blame all of the bad things that occur, hunger, disease, etc., on the fall of Adam and Eve. It's all Adam and Eve's fault. If you are not a biblical literalist, this makes God, this puts God in a bad position because God is responsible for this. And so, you know, the, the evolution didn't create the theodicy problem, but it made it worse by making biblical literalism a, a less viable theological option for many Christians. Now, um, this is not a lecture on Christian theology. A topic like creation and evolution is bound to, want, to, to, to um, wander over many different areas, which is why I've never become tired of it. But just for if anybody is interested in this, there are many books by Christian theologians um, dealing with the issue of evolution and Christian faith. And uh, there are quite a few of them that have been printed in the last 15 or 20 years particularly. And um, let, let me say without going into detail in, a, in only an hour's lecture, that there are answers that Christian theologians have come up with for the theodicy issue, the literalism issue, and so forth. Obviously not all Christians are going to accept them because the main reason why we have conflict over the teaching of evolution in the United States is because of religious opposition. Let me very quickly review for you the history of this controversy, which really began in the early part of the last century. 
In the 1920s, there was an effort to ban the teaching of evolution. You're all undoubtedly familiar with the Scopes trial. William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow, the two most famous legal figures of their day, do remember that Scopes lost, and the anti-evolution books remained upon the, um, uh, the anti-evolution laws, pardon me, remained upon the books of the states that had passed them, including the state of Arkansas. Now, Basically, evolution disappeared from textbooks from about 1930 after the Scopes trial to about 1960. For reasons we won't go into, evolution started coming back into the textbooks in the 1960s. And the state of, Arizona, state of Arkansas had one of these Scopes-type anti-evolution laws and was about to adopt books that included evolution. So the Arkansas Education Association decided just to do a little housekeeping case. Susan Epperson was asked to, uh, she's a 25-year-old uh, high school biology teacher in Little Rock, was asked to be a plaintiff to challenge this old, dusty law that nobody was paying any attention to and um, uh, get rid of it so that we could, so that teachers could use the books without fear of being arrested by somebody for breaking the law. And much to everyone's surprise, this law, this case went all the way to the Supreme Court and became Epperson versus Arkansas. Susan Epperson now lives in Colorado Springs and she's, a, uh, she's still teaching. Um, Epperson struck down anti-evolution laws of the uh, Scopes era, evolution came back into the school curriculum, which generated a new anti-evolution movement in the beginning in the 1960s called creation science. Now, creation science was the idea that you could take a literal special creation view of Genesis and support it using scientific data and theory. Clearly, scientists disagreed that this was possible, but the creation science movement has been very active up until the present day. In fact, the uh, Creation Museum up in, from Answers in Genesis here in Ohio, or sorry, across the, uh, across the river in um, northern Kentucky, I guess you can't be responsible for that. That is an example of creation science, of young earth creationism. Creation science uh, was challenged in court when efforts, uh, when Louisiana and Arkansas passed laws requiring it be taught. And in 1987, Edwards versus Aguilar, a Supreme Court case, all these cases, by the way, are referred to in your pamphlet and the materials from NCSE. Um, Edwards versus Aguilar struck down equal time for creation science laws. The argument was creation science is a religious view. You cannot advocate religious views in the public schools without violating the Establishment Clause. It's a pretty easy deal. The Edwards case, though, did leave a couple of, um, had a couple lines in it, shall we say, that creationists used to uh, generate their next uh, approach. Justice Brennan wrote that teachers, of course, have the right to teach scientific alternatives to evolution, and certainly they do. Um, if you go to your local university and you ask scientists, you know, what are the scientific alternatives to evolution, they will look at you blankly. When you're talking science, evolution is the only game in town. But creation science was originally presented as a scientific alternative to evolution, recall. And intelligent design was fairly quickly um, invented, shall we say, or, or promoted as a scientific alternative to evolution, a la Justice Brennan. In a dissent to Edwards, Justice Scalia wrote that the citizens of Louisiana had the right to have evidence against evolution taught, just like Scopes had the right to teach evolution. And the idea of evidence against evolution is something that creationists have, have uh, leaped upon with great enthusiasm. Intelligent design is an interesting phenomenon, and it'd be lovely to talk about that in more detail. If you have questions, I'm happy to ask, answer them. Uh, I will be at the reception tonight. We can chat informally. Creation science is a bigger set, shall we say. Creation science makes many claims about the Earth being only 10,000 years old, about Noah's flood being a real historical event that laid down all of the um, sedimentary deposits all over the planet, uh, caused the Himalayas to rise, cut Grand Canyon, and so forth and so on. And it also of course, focuses on the Paleon view of design, William Paley's view of design, that, there, that great, greatly complex structures require the direct hand of God to produce. Intelligent design focuses only upon that last. Whoops, hello, what happened to you here? Um, 
I'm sorry. Somehow I seem to have lost, there we go. Um, intelligent design focuses only upon this idea of great complexity requiring God's direct hand, being impossible to explain through natural selection. Doesn't talk about age of the earth, it doesn't talk about Noah's flood, but everything it does talk about pre-existed in creation science. So this is, and this came out in the Kitzmiller versus Stover trial, we, we supported this I think very well. Uh, and so uh, in Kitzmiller, which was only a federal district court case, it was not a Supreme Court case, they got beaten so badly they didn't appeal, frankly. Um, in the Kitzmiller case, it was uh, the judge decided that intelligent design was a religious view. It was, there was no secular reason for teaching it because it was not a valid science. And therefore, to advocate it in the public schools, as in creation science, violated the First Amendment. I want to talk about the second component of the Edwards case, which was the evidence against evolution approach. Right after Edwards, the creationists leaped upon the idea of evidence against evolution and proclaimed that teachers should stress the scientific evidences and arguments against evolution, even if they don't wish to recognize these as evidences for creation. Now this seems kind of odd to hear, but it isn't if you understand that for many, many years, the creation science advocates have been talking about the two-model approach in which there is, exist only the possibilities of evolution and special creationism. Therefore, evidence against evolution means that creationism wins by default. So the literature in creation science consists primarily of looking through the literature and finding the little anomalies that appear to suggest that evolution is an invalid scientific idea. The self-study password is PT330. In Ohio in um, uh, 2002, the science standards initially had a standard that said, describe how scientists continue to investigate and critically analyze aspects of evolutionary theory. Now, the scientists on the committee said, well, what that means is that teachers should look at controversies within evolution, such as, are dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded? Can you have speciation without uh, geographic isolation? There are plenty of interesting controversies within evolutionary biology, and that's what students should study. The creationists had a completely different point of view. As intelligent design proponent uh, Philip Johnson wrote, the recent decision of the Ohio Science Standards Committee has been a big breakthrough. It's not a compromise, it's our position. It allows teachers to present evidence against the theory of evolution. And this, in fact, um, evolved in some rather bad ways. And in 2005, 2006, shortly after the Dover decision, the Ohio Board of Education rescinded that um, standard. Uh, at the National Center for Science Education, we track um, legislation and other anti-evolution efforts. And in the last several years, we've tracked many kinds of anti-evolution uh, um, legislation, most of which fall into the category of academic freedom laws. Now, this is a very interesting approach. Uh, it picks up from um, Scalia's dissent's comment about, do you have the right to teach evidence against evolution? but um, shall we say, packages it in terms of another First Amendment right, free speech. Packages it, packages it in terms of uh, a freedom of speech of academic freedom. So uh, the website uh, academicfreedomact.org has sample legislation that they're encouraging people to convince their legislators to introduce, which would um, uh, allow teachers or encourage teachers to bring in the evidence against evolution. And the, the packaging is really very good. It's, it's very definitely put in terms of academic freedom. Uh, let me teach, says the teacher. Let me think, says the student. Um, those of you who are involved in education law know that the uh, case law is very uh, clear about the very limited amount of academic freedom a K-12 teacher has. Basically, if you, sign a, um, if you sign the contract for teaching in a district, you have agreed to teach their curriculum. You can't just teach willy-nilly. It's very different at the university level where I taught. Uh, K-12 teachers have relatively little academic freedom. Uh, to summarize the academic freedom approach, which I think is uh, uh, quite interesting and worthwhile uh, at least pointing out to you. 
They avoid any mention of religion in these bills because, of course, they're trying to avoid Establishment Clause challenges. Um, creation science and intelligent design fell by the wayside in the past because of Establishment Clause violation. They stress academic freedom, again, uh, uh, a free speech component. They are often protective bills. They often give a teacher a license to teach the alternatives to evolution or evidence against evolution um, so that a district can't tell a teacher not to do it, which has been the case, which I did not review for you here, but the cases are listed on that handout. Several cases, um, uh, Webster versus um, New Lenox in, in, in um, Northern Illinois, the Paloza case in California, several other cases where a teacher was teaching creationism, the district said stop doing this, and the teacher sued for his right to teach creationism, and the um, the judges always said no, you have to do what the teacher, you have to do what the district tells you to do. You know, that, that's the way the case law has been interpreted. But these bills would protect teachers against that kind of directive from a district, which is an interesting approach. They also tend to be permissive bills, saying a teacher may do this, rather than a teacher has to do this. And permissive bills, as you know, uh, I don't have to explain this to you, are very difficult to get a judge to give an injunction on a facial challenge. Uh, it's much more likely that a judge will say, well, no, we don't know whether this is going to result in bad stuff. You know, bring me a case where something's happening and we'll talk. So you need to do an as-applied challenge, and of course those are much, much more difficult to, to find. You have to find the teacher who's actually stepping over the line. You have to find a, a, a student in the class or a parent of a student who is standing. So it's, they, they very cleverly have raised the bar considerably. Um, let me just summarize um, what I've been talking about uh, in the last um, almost hour. At NCSE, we talk about the pillars of creationism. These are the arguments that creationists use uh, for the last 30, 40 years. Um, virtually every argument can be put into one of these three categories. They argue that evolution is invalid science, that scientists are giving up on evolution. This always creates, whenever I show this uh, slide to a university audience with lots of scientists in it, they all burst out laughing because this is a laughable idea to them, but it's very serious uh, in terms of this controversy. They make the religion claim that evolution and especially Christianity are incompatible, that you have to choose between atheistic evolution or Christian creationism, and what we've just been talking about, the fairness argument. It is only fair to teach both as if there were only two. Um, the current situation is uh, where we're having the evidence against evolution and the academic freedom laws uh, that are being uh, circulated around legislatures in the country combine the first pillar of anti-evolutionism with the third pillar of freedom. So it's kind of an interesting combination that uh, legally has not been uh, packaged uh, up until this time. You can find more information on this and other topics at our website, which is ncse.com. There is a um, free Friday um, electronic newsletter that you can sign up to. It's just a very simple couple of bullets and, and links if you're interested in this controversy. The news button up on top there will take you to this page where you can search for your state or other states or you can search for a particular year and find out a great deal about what is happening in the creationism and evolution controversy. And uh, that is all that I want to say in my prepared comments and I thank you very much for being so very attentive. <laughs>